Hey everyone, good morning. Uh, Zach here again coming to you with what is part four of a four-part series that I've been uh, doing this week devoted to the topic of resolving conflict during the shutdown. Last Friday we talked about the importance of showing forbearance in our relationships, bearing with one another, being patient with one another, uh, just gracious, graciously enduring uh, the sins of others and the failures of others and the quirks of others. We talked about forbearance uh, last Friday. Then on Monday of this week, we dealt with the topic of confrontation. When you just can't bear with the sin of another person, when it would actually be the loving thing to bring up their sin with them. Uh, we talked about when we should confront someone about their sin and how and why and all those sorts of things. Then on Wednesday, um, we dealt with the, the issue of confessing sin. You know, when, when you discover through whatever means that you have sinned against another person, um, what do you do? That's what we tried to wrestle with uh, on Wednesday, talking about when and how to confess sin. Um, we talked about the right ways to confess sin and some inadequate ways to confess your sin to others. Now today we're going to talk about the issue of forgiveness. Forgiveness is so important. Um, and it's and it's so often misunderstood. And so today we want to deal with just the questions of what is forgiveness? How can we become more forgiving people? And what does it mean even uh, when you say to another person, I forgive you? What does that mean? I want to wrestle with some of those things here in this video. Um, we need to talk about forgiveness because you, you can't really resolve conflict in any meaningful way uh, without it, without a forgiving attitude and a forgiving disposition toward uh, those who sin against you. Now, there's a biblical assumption under this discussion that I want to bring out first before we even get into some of the nuts and bolts of forgiveness, what it is and what it isn't. The assumption is that Christians, this is an assumption in Scripture, a teaching in the New Testament specifically, that Christians should be ready and willing and committed to forgiving other people. Um, I'm not going to you know, spend a lot of time arguing that or defending that idea. Uh, the New Testament repeatedly teaches that Christians should be forgiving people that those who have been forgiven by God should be ready and willing to forgive others. That's the message of some, some really key biblical texts about forgiveness in the New Testament. Um, Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35, for example, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Uh, you might be familiar with that story. It's a story that Jesus tells to show the ridiculousness of those who have been forgiving, forgiven by God, refusing to forgive other people. Jesus shows in that, in that parable that such a thing is just absurd. Uh, he teaches in that parable that followers of his um, should be ready and willing to forgive others because of how, uh, how great God's forgiveness towards them is and has been. Uh, Jesus teaches there that if God has so forgiven us of our countless eternally offensive sins worthy of eternal damnation, then we also ought to forgive those who sin against us. That's an important passage to, to meditate upon. Uh, it's put in simpler, more straightforward terms in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, which says, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. Which is also very similar to what God says here in Colossians chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13, which we looked at a few days ago, which says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, Bearing with one another, that's forbearance. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. 
as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Um, what's the point in all of these verses and all these passages? It's that forgiven people should be forgiving people. As the Lord has forgiven us of our sins against him, so we ought to forgive others of their sins against us. That's the idea in these passages. It's, it's a repeated idea in the New Testament. Now, when does the need for forgiveness come into play? Um, we talked about, you know, when we dealt with the issue of forbearance, that not every sin needs to be uh, forgiven, per se. It should just be endured, patiently endured. It should roll off your back. You should just move on immediately without having to wrestle through it and talk about it and bring it up and discuss it and fight over it, certainly. Most things should just be uh, endured patiently and graciously. But sometimes the sins of others, including the sins of the members of our own family, need to be forgiven. So when does forgiveness come into play? When does the need for forgiveness come into play? Well, it comes into play when someone has sinned against you, first of all, in a, in a clear way. They've clearly violated God's commands in something that they have done or have not done to you. Their sin has also affected you in a personal way. Uh, you've been negatively affected in some way because of their sin. You've been hurt. You've been disappointed. You've been led to discouragement because of their actions. You've been angered by their actions. In an ideal scenario, the person has also come to see that they have sinned against you. Uh, and they have asked you to forgive them. They've confessed their sin to you uh, in a legitimate way. They've confessed it according to some of the principles we talked about last time and are seeking your forgiveness so that your relationship can somehow be restored, even if the damage to the relationship is only minor in the grand scheme of things. They're coming to you, asking for your forgiveness, seeking to have their relationship with you restored. That's when forgiveness comes into play in an ideal situation. The question is, in those situations, what do you do? What do you do? What does it mean to forgive the person for what they have done? What's it mean? Well, it's important to understand that when the Bible talks about forgiveness, it describes it in terms of a decision to be made. A decision to be made. It's not a feeling to feel. It's not an emotion to conjure up. It's a commitment to to make deliberately and intentionally. Now, there are a couple of words in the, in the New Testament to describe forgiveness. One word gives off the idea of bestowing favor or honor upon a person, showing them uh, grace. Another word uh, used in the New Testament to describe forgiveness gives the picture of a person being released from a debt that they owe to you. You release them from their debt that they've incurred against you. Now, with both of these words, the, the idea is that forgiveness is an act of the will. Okay? And that's really important. It's an act of the will. It's a decision you make. It's a commitment you make to another person. It's a decision to release a person from the burden of having to pay you back for what they've done, and it's a decision to show them grace in return for the wrong that they've done to you. Forgiveness is a commitment. Okay? It's not literally forgetting what has happened, as you know, some popular teaching on forgiveness insists that you have to forget what has happened, as if you can make yourself forget something on command. It's not a feeling, you know, like feeling good about what has happened, somehow feeling good about the person. It's not ignoring what has happened. It's not just sweeping it under the rug and pretending that it didn't happen. In those cases, what need is there for grace, right? It's also not necessarily removing consequences for what has happened, though sometimes it is, not always. It doesn't always remove the consequences. 
for what has happened. I think you see that bear out in Scripture. And in very serious situations, you might say unusually serious situations, it does not even, in my view, require reconciliation. Though in most cases, especially at home in our family relationships, reconciliation is an expression of forgiveness. In more serious, more unusually serious sorts of situations, reconciliation is not necessarily required um, when you forgive a person of their sin. But simply put, forgiveness is a decision that you make to seek the well-being of another person who has not sought your well-being in a particular situation. It's a decision to treat them with kindness and grace and love when they have treated you with things other than those. Now, uh, I mentioned a, a book last time in our discussion on uh, confession. It's a book called The Peacemaker by um, a brother in Christ, a Christian named Ken Sandy. Um, I, I mentioned it when we worked through the seven A's of confession. Uh, and uh, I found that to be a helpful outline. And I'm going to refer to this, this book again because Ken Sandy has laid out some really helpful um, uh, uh, he's given a really helpful explanation for what real forgiveness is. And in his book, he, he, uh, he breaks forgiveness down into four basic promises, four promises of forgiveness that I think are a very useful breakdown of what it should mean when you say you forgive someone for their sin against you. There's four promises of forgiveness um, that Ken Sandy argues for. The first is, I will not dwell on this incident. I will not dwell on this incident. Okay, so it's a commitment not to just keep thinking about it and mulling over it in your head and and chewing on the injustice of the situation and just meditating upon it. You're not going to do that. You're not going to intentionally spend time cultivating uh, feelings of bitterness or anger for what has happened. I will not dwell on this incident. Secondly, the second promise of forgiveness is, I will not bring up this incident again and use it against you. And I think that's the really important part. I'm not going to bring this up again in order to hurt you in return for the way you've sinned against me. I'm not going to bring it up again to, you know, hold it over your head and make you continue to feel guilty for what you've done. I will not bring it up again and use it against you. That's the second promise of forgiveness that Ken Sandy lays out. The third promise is I will not talk to others about this incident. I will not talk to others about this incident. And I think what he's getting at is like gossip kind of talk specifically. Um, you know, getting counsel is acceptable. And getting godly counsel uh, may be very helpful as you seek to keep your commitment to forgive someone. Sometime, sometimes in some cases you need to continue talking it out. Not in a vengeful way, but in a constructive way. You might need some outside eyes uh, you might need some outside advice. That's okay, but when you're promising to forgive someone, you're saying, I'm not, I'm not going to be talking to others about this as if um, you're continually guilty of what you've done. I'm not going to talk to others about this to continue stirring it up in my own heart. Um, I will not talk to others about this incident. Um, then the fourth promise of forgiveness that Ken Sandy lays out is, I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. Now again, I commend these promises to you for the vast majority of situations where forgiveness is needed in a relationship. The vast majority of situations. The vast majority of situations at home where forgiveness is needed. There may be, and I want to add this caveat, there may be, though, some more serious, more urgent situations where we'd have to modify some of these promises. 
a little bit um, or significantly even. Um, but in the, the majority of situations, I think these four promises of forgiveness really do hold up. Okay? But this is what forgiveness is. You're declaring that a matter between you and the person who has sinned against you is dealt with. It's dealt with and done. You're putting it into the ground and moving on. Okay? You're committing to show the person grace and love and goodness and kindness in return for their sin, and they don't have to pay penance to make it right with you. Several years ago, I wrote out this forgiveness promise, and I've applied it um, in various ways, various situations over the years. Maybe it would be helpful to you. This is a, a promise of forgiveness to someone who sins against you, and I just want to read it to you, and I hope that it's helpful. This is the attitude of forgiveness. Forgiveness says, I'm not going to treat your sins like they are alive and well in my life. I'm not going to mull over them as if they're continuing to say new hurtful things to me. I'm not going to continue holding them over your head as if you are constantly committing them against me. And I will not talk about you as if you are. I also will not tie my intentions and disposition toward you to your future performance. And I'm not going to allow your sins to have the final say regarding what our relationship will look like in the future. I'm going to move on, wishing you no harm, praying for your eternal good, and seeking wisdom regarding what kind of relationship with you would most honor God going forward. When I find myself hurting over what has been done, I will seek grace to make sure I do not become bitter. When I need to talk to someone about what I am feeling or thinking, I will seek grace to make sure that I am not gossiping. When or, if I, it, when or if I interact with you in the future, I will seek grace to make sure that I do not hold your sins over your head. And as I think about what a God-honoring relationship with you would look like from this point on, I will seek grace to make sure that your sins against me are not the only things or the ultimate things that I consider. I'm going to trust Jesus to carry out perfect justice to meet all of my needs to give me wisdom regarding the future, and strength to do whatever is right. I will not seek vengeance. I will not try to get back to get back at you, nor will I try to make you feel what I have felt. Because of Christ's death on my behalf, God's all-encompassing sovereignty and flawless justice, as well as the comfort I have and will experience with Jesus at my side, I am releasing you from any and all requirement to pay me back for what you have done. You do not have to weigh out your bad with your good. You do not have to perform, and you do not have to pay penance. By grace, I am getting on with my life, looking ahead, pressing on, and putting this behind me for good. Now, that's the attitude of forgiveness. That's a commitment of forgiveness. And here's something that needs to be said. There is no excuse, none, for a person who has been graciously forgiven by his creator for all his sins, past, present, and future, and reconciled to God by nothing but free and utter grace to refuse to show grace to a fellow sinner who has sinned against him. There's no excuse for that. Ken Sandy says in this book that Christians are the most forgiven people in the world. Therefore, he says, we should be the most forgiving people in the world. This is what we're called to do with those who sin against us. And nothing short of this. To be a Christian, you have to learn to forgive those who sin against you. You have to. Um, and admittedly, this is, this is oftentimes really difficult. It's necessary, but it's, it's super hard. It feels much safer to hold grudges and keep those offenses in our back pocket and nurse them and nurse bitter feelings toward the person who has sinned against us. And our sin, forgiving those who sin against us, comes much more uh, natural, or I should say not forgiving those who sin against us, comes much more natural to us than forgiveness. That's a fact. 
So how can we get better at forgiveness? Um, how can we become more forgiving people? Or if you're having a hard time forgiving someone for their sin against you, what are some things that you can think through or meditate upon to move yourself along toward forgiving them? This video is becoming a little long, so I want to uh, give you a few things to meditate on deeply and regularly. Um, I'll offer five things to consider, and then we'll wrap it up here. Number one... I want to encourage you to remember that you are a sinner too. You are a sinner too. You have sinned against God in countless ways. Um, you are not better than the person who has sinned against you. You're one of them. You're the same. You're one and the same. You're a sinner in need of grace just like they are. Number two, remember that God has been more gracious to you than you can fathom. God in Christ, if you're a Christian, has shown you more grace than you're aware of and that I'm aware of. We don't know all the ways we've sinned against God. We know that we have, but we don't know how in every case. Um, our brains aren't even capable to keep a record of every single time we've sinned against the Lord. And yet he sees it all and he has covered it all and removed it from our record because of the cross because of Christ and by his grace. You've, you've been more forgiven by God than you can fathom. you got to remember that. Then number three, remember that God is sovereign over the sins that have been committed against you. We see this in Scripture time and time again. So many examples of this, how God uses uh, what, what man intends for evil, God intends for good. God uses for good. Somehow God intends to teach you good things and bring good results out of this situation. Whatever it may be, no matter what the person has done to you, God is sovereign over it, and he's intending to use it for your good. Number four, remember that the sins of your offender have either been or will be punished in full. What do I mean by that? Well, if they're a Christian, Jesus has already suffered and paid for their sins on the cross. What more punishment could you possibly desire to see carried, about, carried out upon them? Jesus has already died for them. He's already suffered for their sins. If they're not a Christian, the person who sinned against you, then their sins, if they don't repent in the end, those sins will be judged eternally in hell. You're not the judge. God will deal with their sins far more justly than you can. So you've got to remember that. Their sins either have been or will be punished in full. Fifthly, remember that Christ is with you and the Holy Spirit is living in you. Christ is with you and the Holy Spirit is living in you. With the help of God who gives himself fully to you in Christ through the Spirit, you can obey his word. You can do this and forgive your offenders. Christ is in you. The Spirit is in you. And then I guess there is a, a sixth thing I'd like to add before we close. It's that I want to encourage you to consider how you could glorify God and display the gospel by extending forgiveness to your offender. Do all things to the glory of God is what Scripture says, right? Do all things to the glory of God, including this. Make more of God and his grace than you make of the sins of other people. Situations needing forgiveness are opportunities to put the grace of God on display. I want to encourage you to remember that. How can you glorify God in this? That's what this situation is about. That's what every situation requiring forgiveness is ultimately about. It's about the glory of God and magnifying His grace. So how can you do that in this situation? Um, Ken Sandy Again, just to quote him one last time, he leaves his discussion of forgiveness with a really encouraging word. He says, by thought, word, and deed, you can demonstrate forgiveness and rebuild relationships with people who have sinned against you. No matter how painful the offense, with God's help, you can make the promises of forgiveness and imitate the forgiveness and reconciliation that was demonstrated on the cross. 
By the grace of God, he says, you can forgive as the Lord forgave you. I pray this is helpful to you in the coming days. Uh, if you have specific questions about forgiveness, situations that require forgiveness that you need some help wrestling through, I'd be honored to wrestle through those things with you. Just shoot me a question by text or email or some other way. Um, but hopefully this will be helpful to you in the coming days, both at home during the shutdown and then everywhere else once life begins to return to normal. So I hope to see you soon, Lord willing. So God's grace to you in the meantime.